uh, anger. The only one, yes, the only one true God, yes, he's the same uh, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, and uh, he's the God of all comfort, uh, the God of mercy, uh, the Father of love. If you talk about love, you can't find it anywhere except in him. Hallelujah. So we bless him for giving us this day. We're together in this place to learn a couple of things that will help us uh, in this life. Hallelujah. We welcome viewers all around the world. This is Liberty House International Church coming to you live by way of YouTube and Facebook. In case you miss any portion of this live stream, please go to our web page, libertyhouseusa.org. Once again, libertyhouseusa.org. Or go to our YouTube channel. Please type in our name, Liberty House International Church, and treat yourself the videos that we have uh, online. Our mission here is to push you forward to help you advance in your walk with the Lord and for you and not against you, a messenger of the Lord Jesus Christ an agent of change and transformation with a unique delivery. So in case I say something that doesn't resonate with you, please don't pick any fire. Check everything that I say away the word. If you like some use it, if it doesn't, then trash it. All right, so let's go into the word of the Lord. Uh, it's interesting that uh, some don't know that the Bible from Genesis to Revelation writes on just one theme. And it's about one person. Okay? It's about one person. It's about redemption. It's about one person, the Lord Jesus Christ. And therefore, when you begin from Genesis, you're going to see Jesus Christ in every book. Jesus Christ in every book, in every book, in every book, all the way. Uh, I mean, from the Old Testament to the day that he was born, and then all the way to the book of Revelation. Now, why am I saying that? Because... Um, Jesus Christ was not introduced as Jesus Christ as the man that lived here on earth. Some people were born around the same time he was born, or some people were, were born before him and they saw him, um, and the son talked to him and stuff like that. He, he wasn't a phony, he was real. He lived. Hallelujah. All right. But until then, people have known. The creator of the universe as God, 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 and refer to him God, God, God. So it's like uh, God is distant. So far as you're talking about relationship with God, when they got to know him as even the uh, self-existent one, uh, they couldn't even use the name. They started using Yahweh. They wouldn't pronounce the word Yehovah or Yahweh. All right. So that's what it was. That's why they had a problem with Jesus when he showed up and he started saying, I am the Father. The Father is in me, I am the Father. And I am the Father, we are one. They had a problem. How dare you? Who are you to refer to God? It's sacred name that we can't even you know, pronounce or whatever. You refer to him as a Father and you are with him. All right, but Jesus, you see, God introduced himself progressively to folks under the Old Testament. Gradually bringing them, you know, to uh, know Jesus or to be exposed to Jesus. So it's Jesus who, for the first time, brought really the full fledged or exposed us to the uh, full scope of who God is. That's what the Bible says is the express image of God. Jesus is the express or express image of God. Now, so he's the first person that started referring to God as Father, 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 Father. And now, anybody who is born again, anybody who has accepted Jesus Christ as the Lord and Savior, can also refer to God, the Creator, as Father. It's so interesting that Jesus said, I go to my Father, your Father. Whilst he was on earth, that's what he said. I'm going to your Father, my Father. Hallelujah. But why, why are we talking about this? Even though we are talking about the adoption, I don't think um, some Christians understand that. That is why normally when they refer to God or they are dealing with God, they deal with Him as God and not God, their Father. Hallelujah. You realize that Jesus in His ministry, He referred to 
God as Father, 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 Father. It's only on the cross when he bore the sins of the whole world that he said, uh, what? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And that he said, because the burden, the sin, just like the brass uh, serpent in, in the wilderness was lifted up. He was lifted up, taking a place of shame, condemnation, and the penalty of sin, which is death. And this was prophesied in, uh, by David in the book of Psalms. So when he said that, he was fulfilling scripture. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? But apart from that, always he will say, Father, Father. Father. This is interesting. So let's read um, Romans chapter 8 from verse 15. Because I'm still on the uh, uh, adoption uh, kind of series, but I'm hitting it from different angles. Okay? From 15, Romans 8, reading from the New King James Version, it says, For you, you did not. You did not. So something that is zero, neither. It didn't happen. Okay, you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear. So that is not what we have. We have nothing to do with fear. He didn't give us fear. Because in Second uh, Timothy chapter 1, 7, he says, For God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of uh, power, love, and sound mind. So we don't have anything to do, uh, to do with fear. When we allow fear to come into our lives, we have, uh, how should I say this? The feeling of fear, even though it's actual, it's substantial, still is not truth. Because at times you may feel fear, and when you check the reason why you're afraid, you realize that I shouldn't even be afraid in the first place. So I'm saying, saying that the feeling of fear, even though it's a fact, it's not always True. <laughs> Hallelujah. Now we can talk about the people in the uh, Old Testament. We can talk about people who were faced with situations and they were afraid. Okay? But it's based, the feeling was legitimate. That's what I'm trying to say. But when you look at it in the light of God's word, His uh, wisdom, His uh, insight and foresight, and His reality, if one was aware of all that, they wouldn't even be afraid. There would not be any place for them to be fearful. Like one time they said, oh, oh, don't you care? We perish, you are going to die. They thought you were going to sink. You know, but that was it. That was it, the situation. But they felt fear. So I'm saying this to say that we don't have anything to do with fear. And we have to know how to resist fear. Because throughout the word of God, if the enemy wants to do something with anybody, he will have to sell you his thought, his idea, or what? Some kind of suggestion. All right? And normally fear is one of the things. A thought of fear, idea, suggestion of fear, looking at the situation, then it can be all out there. But you received. Now this is what we have received. You receive the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. And that is, uh, that is quite, or I should say, very significant. Without the spirit of adoption, there's no way you can cry, Abba, Father. What happened is the moment Jesus said to Nicodemus, when he asked the question, how can a man be born again? Can he enter into his mother's womb the second time and be born? No, he said, no, 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 that's not what I'm talking about. The second man be born from above uh, in John chapter 3. So the moment one confesses with his mouth the Lord Jesus and believes in your heart that God raised him from the dead, instantaneously, supernaturally, you know, uh, beyond, I'll say, God kind of uh, seed, you know, it happens just like that. God adopts the person. And the moment you are adopted, there's a knowing that you cannot explain. Words are not enough. But there's a knowing that, you know, I am a child of God. According to uh, John 1, 12. It says, for as many as receive him, to them you give the right to become sons of God. 
So it happened just like that. You are now a child of God. And that is why we can cry, Abba, Father. We can say Father. How come the people in the Old Testament, they couldn't refer to God as Father? Because then the Holy Spirit was not indwelling in them. It can come upon people for a function, for an assignment, for a task, for a vision from God and all that. And that's it. But over here, when you accept Jesus Christ as a Lord and Savior, the Messiah, the Spirit of God comes to indwell you. You become one with Jesus Christ. And that is what? Beautiful. I want us to understand this very well because a lot of folks don't understand it. That's why they use God like a, a jackpot kind of machine. Or they see God as um, some kind of investment program. You know, I can give this into this or make this investment and I'm going to get this in return. Or I can put this uh, quarters that I have in the jackpot machine and pull the labor and then I'm going to, you know, who knows, I'm going to win, you know, thousands of dollars. No, it's the system of God is not like that. You see, God is a God of relationship. And Jesus Christ showed up. He died so we can have relationship. He wants to call us his children. And he wants us to see him, know him as a good father. You know, at times you say, God is good. And you realize that the church keeps saying, God is good, God is good. It's true. You know, and that more relates to the Old Testament. Okay? When we talk about the loving kindness, the goodness of God, that relates more to the Old Testament. When we come to the New Testament or the New Covenant, we are talking about love. And in love, there's goodness. It's amazing. So if you say God is love, but we know why we say God is good. And that's what we say all the time. And all the time, that's what we will say God is good. You see? So we see him as what? Well, distant. Distant. When you talk about New Covenant, New Testament era, dispensation, you are talking about God who is personal. Very close. Very dear. I remember one thing that, um, one of the things that we received in church, someone came and said, oh wow, here you make a God uh, uh, become so personal, real to me. But this is someone who's been going to church all these years and has degrees too. But yet, this is what the person is saying. That's the way it should be. That's beautiful. Yeah. You know, that is why I say that when you are praying, don't learn this from this in our nations by saying, Father God, Father God, Father God. See, we pick this up not from the Master, the Lord Jesus Christ Himself. We picked it up from some kind of denomination, kind of what lines, because we see people do it, and therefore we, we do it. You get it. But should I say this? Yes. Okay. Let me say it. I was processing the thought. If you read the Word of God more than you read commentaries and books that people have written, you'll be on a better kind of what side of life. The problem is we try to read commentaries or books that people have written. They've extracted uh, what verses, references from the Bible. And then they put a spin on it, they share their own thoughts and whatever, opinions, and people are crazy about that. But if you read the Word of God, that will help you. And even the book that you're reading is the one who wrote it, or what they have uh, you know, put in, in, in print, if it's off, you'll be able to detect that. That's the difference. But if you don't read your Bible, you say, oh, so and so even wrote the book. So and so is so. Oh, don't you know so and so? He's, he's renowned. He has what churches all over the world. He has a large following. And we are singing. I'm not making light of this, but this it will help the point that I'm making. We see these things make mega ministers. Then they come apologizing for teaching something wrong. 
To the point that some even say all the books that are written, throw them away. My series, throw them away. But people have followed that. They have talked to those things. That's why I'm saying that I read the word more than you read commentaries or what uh, people's books. How come it's easy for you to read somebody's book, but you can't take the book itself and read it? Why? You have to ask yourself that question. If I say something, somebody is going to, okay, let me say it. This is one of the things I say my delivery is unique. Could it be due to laziness? So, well, when I'm reading the Bible, it takes too long, but you see, this guy wrote the thing and he's put everything out there. At times when he put <laughs> <laughs> bullet points, somebody would say, bullet points, you know, straight, straight, straight. Lazy, 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 lazy. <laughs> uh, we use the seven sister, okay, sister and see. <laughs> Hallelujah. So adoption, this is heavy. Look at the next verse. You see, when you when you know God, I'll say this to you, when I started. I didn't also know God as Father. My reference towards God as Father was in heaven. You know, it was like God was like a religious personality to me. Oh, the person that would say, there's no God like him. There's no equal of his. He's the one that created the heavens and the earth. He's God. He makes a way in the what well, see in the back from the mighty waters that's God. He spoke in this God. Say this that's God. If you, if you mess with him, with him, he's going to strike you dead. You open the what the earth and swallow people up. God, you know. But we don't look at him. You know, through what Jesus Christ has done for us, his death, his resurrection, his ascension, and sitting on the right hand of the Father. Through him, now, God who was distant. What happened in the Old Testament? The folks were afraid of him. They didn't even see him, but they saw the effects, some effects, because Moses went on the uh, the mountain for the, what do you call it, what's the name? The, 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 the tablets, the uh, Old Testament. Hold on, hold on, I said, no, that's not what I want to say, the tablets. Because when I said tablets, something came to my mind. I was going to crack a joke, and that's why it took my mind off. So I have the Commandments. <laughs> I was going to say that the tablets were being used way before whoever, you know, came out with tablets. <laughs> came out with that. <laughs> so Moses was on the mount. And then when he came back for that now, they couldn't look at his face. And then they said, okay, you, we don't want to come close to this God. We don't want you to talk to him. You listen to him. Let him tell you everything he wants to tell us. You come to us, tell us, and we'll do it. That's what they said. See, but I love the way in the book of John, uh, God, uh, Jesus said, If any man loves me, the Father and I will come and make our good personal. Hallelujah. You are my tabernacle, personal. I'm the head of this union, this body, personal. We've been baptized into the body of Christ, personal. Adoption. We are heirs of God and joint heirs because Jesus is the firstborn of the Father. We are joint heirs within personal. We are the family of God because that's one of our, one of the ways that the church is referred to, the family of God. Personal. And therefore we have to begin to Transition, move, shift gears into that light. Because when we started as Christians, we didn't know much when we accepted Jesus Christ I'm referring to. We didn't know much about God. But every day, day in, day out, week after week, month after month, year after year, we are learning something about God. And the more you learn, the more you know Him. And the more you know Him, the more you adjust. The more you shift gears. Hallelujah. You position yourself. And it will help you even see things that we call doing church. Things that are practiced in church. I mean, I'm talking about believers. When they gather, they practice, they do. Routines, rituals, norms, and whatever. You realize that some of those things are even off. Though 
They may, you know, make people feel good or whatever, but you can tell that they are off. And the word will let you know that, wow, I can't believe that we've been doing this for a long time, over 10 years. And this is not even biblical, but we do it and we enjoy it. Hallelujah. Now, when people start to pray, by the way they pray, you can tell. You can tell where they are in their relationship with the Heavenly Father. Jesus said, when you pray, say what? Our Father. It is say God. <laughs> I guess people like to say that because they feel that it's part of God. But when you say Father, it's like, hmm. Am I, am I being, uh, what, how, what's the word that she uh, what, um, what's the word? You know that from what's the word? Um, familiarity, yeah. Like you're being familiar, like you think you and God, you are on, what, equal plane or what? No, he's giving us that what? Privilege. He's giving us that blessing to be family with him. And if you are struggling with it, then you have what? Some kind of what? Complex. Can you say complex? If you struggle with that, he, you didn't ask for it. Alright? He showed up. He said, I'm blessing you to become family with me. You have to open it wholeheartedly. Accept it. It shouldn't be like, oh, that's too much. Like some people do at times. God, I know you can deal with hundred dollars, but if I'm asking you for thousand dollars, I think that's too much. So you just give me hundred dollars. We see how God can do this easily by thousand dollars. Wow. The Spirit Himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. We are children of God. We are children of God. And when we say, I'm a child of God. We should say it with some depth of understanding. Understanding this subject of adoption. We are heirs, joint heirs with Jesus Christ. Heirs of God, joint heirs with Jesus Christ. God loves us. Many people say, God loves me, God loves me, God loves you. But it's like he ends there. He doesn't go beyond that to that uh, light of him being our Father. Hallelujah. He studied the book of uh, uh, John, especially the 17th, uh, 17th chapter, when Jesus was praying for the disciples, the apostles, before he, he was uh, about to leave them. Hallelujah. The Spirit, don't resist the Holy Spirit. Okay? Accept what the Holy Spirit is telling you. You see, doing this and saying this may not be the norm. You know, and people may come against you, but that is what you have to say. Jesus said the words, let's have John 14, 10, and then we'll come back. We'll have a finish. Let's have John 14, 10. I was just going to say it, but it's good that we we'll say Do you not believe that I am in the Father, and the Father was in me? The words that I speak to you, what? I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does the works. That is Jesus. And we have to copy him. We have to mimic him. That's what the Bible says, actually. We have to mimic him. Amen. So if he spoke this way, we have to speak the same way. You know, you know, people, just like the scribes, the Pharisees, and the chief priests and whatever, they were against uh, what he was saying, you know, he still said it. So we still have to say it. He could say it because he had understanding of it. He could say it because he had accepted it. He could say it because he was experiencing it. He could say it because that was his walk. That was his lifetime. So it's easy to say it. Hallelujah. Have you realized that once in a while, when we are going through a situation or something, then we come up with, then, oh, uh, okay, I know I say this also often, God is still on the throne. You know, one of the things I say, oh, my father is rich. Refer to God, my father. Okay, how many people say that? Once in a while, 
We are addressed to God as Father, and that's it. When that kind of, that, that moment, when the issue or the situation of is over, and then that's it. We forget about the fact that, or the truth, that he is still our Father. Personal, our Father, my Father. Jesus said, when we pray, say, our Father. And I love it, and we said, I'm going to, when he was uh, even raised. That's what he told uh, Mary. Go tell them. I'm going to my father and your father. I love it. Hallelujah. I'm going to my father and your father. Go tell them. Hallelujah. Okay, let's go back to the Roman state that we're reading. Let's go to the 16th verse. Okay, so the spirit bears witness with us that we are children of God. This is one thing that will go on in your, in your whole life. Your whole life is never going to stop. Anytime the enemy wants to trick you, or any situation that shows up, or anything that knocks on your, on your door, that is trying to sway you from this truth, the Holy Spirit will always remind you that you are the child of God. Because one of the things, he's called what? The helper. And what does he do? Let's go to John uh, 14, 26. John 14, 26. But the helper, the Holy Spirit. But the helper, the Holy Spirit. This is why at times uh, I don't understand some people in the faith. They are asking for help. And I keep asking them, what help are you asking for? When God has given you help, that is the helper. There is help for you right there. Help for what? Anything and everything in life. Anything that relates to life, anything that relates to your productivity, anything that relates to your increase, anything that relates to your well-being, anything that relates to you working your purpose, anything that relates to you fulfilling uh, the destiny, the counsels of God concerning your life, you have received help. God has already, uh, already unleashed what? Help to you. He's giving you help. He's not waiting that, oh, oh, now you are going to cross the road. Okay, I need somebody to stop the cars for you. I need somebody to push the button on the road, uh, the light, so the traffic light will stop and then you can cross. No, you know, <laughs> God has already given you help. That is why I keep saying you don't pray for help, you thank God for help. Two different things. When you are in a situation, you, you see, all this is connected to sonship. Adoption, sonship, adoption. When you know that you're a child of God, you are adopted by the Father, and you see him as Father, and not God, distant, but personal. You see, you will be doing certain things. You are not going to be praying, God, I need help. Have you realized I said, God, I need help? God, I'm asking you to help me. That's how you will pray. God, I'm asking you to help me. But he said, Father, I thank you for your help in this matter. What we are looking now, what is on the table now, this situation, I thank you for your help. Is that not the way Jesus prayed? He never asked for help. I thank you that you always will hear me. Because, you see, we have to learn from him. Some will say, oh, okay, 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 okay. What is wrong in asking help from God? There's everything wrong with it. Everything on scripture for you as a child of God. Because he has given you help. You have to take it. You have to receive it. And this is the way I can describe it for you to understand. Let's say somebody is sinner and is praying for salvation. When you pray for salvation, Jesus is not going to be crucified again. He's already crucified. His blood is already given. His blood is already shed. That anybody who believes him or they put their trust in him will be what? Saved. So you don't ask for that. You accept it. That's it. That is why what? We lead people, when we lead people to uh, 
and what do you call it? To Jesus Christ, we say, say this prayer. Some people call that sinless prayer. And that sinless prayer is one prayer that I realize that you pray it differently, and a lot of uh, those prayers are not in line with the scripture. They say, and, uh, I'm, uh, God, I'm asking you to save me. No, he, there's, there's nothing there in scripture that says he's asking to save you. You know? <laughs> The Bible says, if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. That is, they ask. And some of you go to the state, they say that uh, I ask you to forgive me my sins. You see, they add all these things. The Bible says, whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. They say it. You know, but we add all these things. I think it makes us look good. In the end, we confuse a lot of people. Now, it's reduced. Salvation message. It's not given anymore. Now they call it a word, salvation prayer. If you want to be saved, say these uh, words after me. You will be saved. No. No. That's not right. Say, Jesus, I accept you into my life. and uh, Make me one of your children. Come live in me. And we ask him, come live in me. He said, when you accept him, he will live in you. You don't have to ask him to come. I will say, God knows how to do his job. You don't need to Tell him to do his job. You you don't need to counsel God. You don't need to advise him. You don't need to even remind him. But that's what we are doing. You see, that's some kind of a complex kind of a, what behavior. Hallelujah. The Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father. You see what he's saying? The Father will send in my name. He said, God, the Father will send in my name. He will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I've said to you. So when we read the Bible, we know we are children of God. Anytime the enemy wants to tell you otherwise, then the Holy Spirit will remind you. You are that in one witness. You are a child of God. You are a child of God. Hallelujah. We have a righteous word standing, right standing before God. Amen. Now, look at this in the um, Amplified Version. This is going to be a lot. It says, But the comforter. When we talk about comfort, he's giving us a comforter. Not only when people are bereaved and I get to talk to them. Based on my knowledge and my what maturity at this level, I always tell them the Holy Spirit Himself, who knows how to comfort people, who will do His job, He will comfort you. You know, but at times we pray to someone nice, politically what correct. I think that's what we do. Okay, so somebody will pray. I pray in the name of the Lord Jesus that in this time. The Lord who will comfort you, yeah, the comfort God will send you. May God give you comfort and all that. No, that is the wrong prayer to pray. Somebody says, What is wrong with that? Let me show you what is wrong with that. The believer that is bereaved, God has already given that believer comfort or comforter. So you thank God. If you're going to pray, say, Okay, Father, I thank you. It's like, he knows what is going on already. You don't have to tell him. But I thank you for my brother and my sister who is going through this time of bereavement. And I thank you for your comfort that is at work in his life and life. That is it. People don't know Thanksgiving as prayer. Thanksgiving to is prayer. It's prayer. That is proper prayer. When God has done something, you thank him. Hallelujah. Now, the fact that let's say somebody is bereaved and they are all of the, the place in their emotions, they can't take it, especially when it's unexpected or the person is very young. It's, it's very harsh, traumatizing, devastating, use all the words that you can use. It's true. But then what happens? You, as a child of God, you always have to stay on track, stay in your lane. What is your lane? The path of righteousness. What is that lane? It's truth. What is that lane? You grieve not as unbelievers what? do. You don't grieve like unbelievers. That's it. What is that lane? You know that 
the helper, the Holy Spirit is your straightener, is your help, is your comforter. And in this time of bereavement, you are not without comfort. So what? You are uh, tap into that comfort. You tap. Yeah, yeah, I'm not saying you are not going to feel what has happened. You feel it. Because you see, you are still working in progress. You are still on earth. You feel it. But you see, the Holy Spirit will help you so you don't become a mess. If we go through anything and we become a mess, that is not good. It makes God look so bad. Like He doesn't have any help for us. So you have to understand what I'm saying. I'm not saying be in denial. I'm not saying suppress or repress your feelings. You don't repress or suppress your feelings, but you confront them in the light of God's word by taking the help that God has already won, giving you. That's it. And it doesn't make you uh, like a King Kong. You see, anytime you say yes to the word of God, like it says in everything, give thanks. Somebody said, oh, why are you quoting this? Why are you quoting it? He gives you are my shoes and you know what I'm going to do. You will tell me. What do you expect a person to tell you? Tell you agree, agree to dance, or stay in there. We are to help one another. How do we help people? To yank them out of where they ought not to be. So when I realize you are sinking deep in grief, it's true you are bereaved, but you are sinking. You suffer the predicament, but that is uh, taking your life. It's draining you. It's controlling you. It's dominating you. What do I do? I have to lift you up. How do I lift you up? Speaking the word of God. Reminding you as a child of God. The helper, the comforter is with you. The strengthener is with you. You can go through this world victoriously. Take your stand, position yourself. Go through victoriously. God hasn't abandoned you. Yes. Your father is still with you. Your father still loves you. Especially when people walk. I mean, they blow it big time. They feel like, okay, that's it. Their world is uh, crashing down them. You talk to them, you see, your father is still with you. Your father, the father still loves you. You are so, you know, the prodigal says, son said, how many of my father's high servants? He has so much and there's uh, so much to what? Spare. And look at me. Then he said, I'll go and tell my father, make me one of your what? High servants. That's, all, that's how we feel when we are going through our times. But I want you to know, walking in this sonship, this adoption, it has nothing to do with feelings. It's about God. It's about his word. It's about what Jesus has done. It's about God's promise, the offer, the help, the provision, grace, favor that is given to us. That's it. That's it. We take it and use it. You see, we are not supposed to do life by our own strength. That's why he's giving us the helper, the Holy Spirit. The Amplified Version says, but the comforter. You see, the helper, like I said, it covers every arena of our lives, every area, every world, facet of our lives. Hallelujah. But the comforter, counselor, helper, intercessor, advocate, strengthener, standby. He's not surprised by anything. Never ever surprised. Hallelujah. The Holy Spirit. That's the person we are talking about. You see, remember, Jesus had to have the Holy Spirit by him. So in Acts 10, 38, the Bible says, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. As a result, he was able to go on about doing his work. Healing all those that were what? Oppressed by the devil. The Holy Spirit was right there. How was he raised? The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit that raised up Jesus from the dead, despite where they put him in the tomb and the stone that he took a what? More than whatever people to roll the stone and all that, but supernaturally, the Holy Spirit rolled the stone. Moving angels to roll the stone. And Jesus came out, this same Holy Spirit in you, 
and you're asking for help. We are so used to it. So when he said pray that, you know, God, I thank you. Father, I thank you for help. They don't get it. You understand? You say, okay, I, I'm at a, I'm at a, I want you to come in. Uh, I'm at a junction or what? Uh, for crossroads. Yeah, thank you. That's what I'm going to say. Crossroads, I don't know which way to go. Okay, then we say, okay. But God knows. Then we forget that he's our father. And he loves us. So he knows it. He's our shepherd. He knows it. He's the way. He knows it. He's the truth. He knows it. He knows what evening is to come. He knows it. And he said he will guide us into all truth. He knows it. So what do we do? It's not hiding that from us. So you get to that place and say, Father, I thank you for your direction. I used to pray many, many years ago before the revelation. That's one of the things. I'm asking you to guide me. I'm asking you to lead me. I'm asking you to guide me. I'm asking you to lead me. I'm asking you to uh, uh, show me your way. Then I came to realize that well, with revelation, all under my steps and all that, also, 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 Old Testament. Now the Bible that is written, it covers every step that you need to take. Aha, uh -huh, I know. <laughs> that one thing. Every step that you need to take, if you know your word, you know what to do. But the problem is people don't know the word. So at times, you see this whole uh, as you go in the church. So they put a responsibility on God. Like, God, if you show me your will, I'll do it. You know, I'll do it. I will do your will. But just that I don't know it. So if you show it to me, I'll do it. But look, <laughs> the word of God is the uh, word. Reveal the will of God. And areas that I'll say they are so personal, then that is where the Holy Spirit comes in. Do you know what I'm saying? That's why the Bible says in the Romans that we are reading, it says, For as soon as I are led by the Holy Spirit, they are the sons of God, the leading of the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. So the more you study the word, the more you know the will of God. For instance, uh, now I know that uh, what? In everything, give thanks. That's what the Bible says. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning your life. In every situation, give thanks. So what do you do? You begin to live like that in every situation. But what would we do most of the time? The slightest opposition, the slightest pressure in life, the slightest storm, trial, or whatever, then, oh, oh what am I going to do? Oh, I can't believe this is happening at this time. Wow. I never, I never saw this one coming. Now what do I do? You know, man, we act like we are helpless. Helpless? 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 Really? No, we are not helpless. Am I saying it right? Yeah. I think probably we like to, you know, play with our emotions a bit. We like the, you know, when we are into our emotions and all that. It's fine. I always tell people, like I say, you can cry. When you cry for some time, you stop, wipe your face, come on, you know, get back on track. That's it. Because, you see, you can cry, but you have to ask yourself, if you cry for that long, what help do you receive? Does that change the situation? This is why I'm saying that don't suppress the feeling, don't repress the feeling. You have to uh, let it out. But do it scripturally. Hallelujah. Then look. All the friends we have in Jesus, all our sins and griefs to die, all the privilege we carry, everything to God in prayer. Oh, what, what? Peace we offer for faith. Oh, what need of sin we bear. All because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. Thanksgiving is also prayer. Yeah, you can't do life without it. That's why it's giving us all these things. So instead of saying, order my steps. Father, thank you that you put in my spirit what step to take, the choice to make. And at times the word of God, you see, when you know it, it guides you. 
when you talk about relationship, it's the same. The word of God will guide you. If you are going to talk to somebody, the word of God will guide you. That's how the word says that um, we should speak the truth in love. Okay? It says we should put away what? Lying. It says that whatever comes out of our mouth should not be corrupted. It should minister grace or edify the hearer. You see, it's the word of God guiding you. So how am I going to pray? Lord, I'm going to talk to this person now. I'm asking you to guide me. We pray that we feel so pious. I pray, you know, before I even talk to this person, I pray that God should help me, you know, and at times preachers do that. And when I see that, it bothers me. A preacher will come and take the microphone when they are introduced. Then now, look at this. Just look at how serious this is. The service is going on. Praise so much if everything has taken place. And at times you see that there's a move on you of the Holy Spirit. They take the mic, then they say, um, the God of this is that we invite your presence down to this meeting. And now I'm asking you to give me the make my tongue, the, the, the what? Pen of a ready writer. And I'm asking you to anoint me, speak through me. And nah, this is Bogum Zayamas. That's show. You are trying to impress people. If that is not what the person is doing, then that tells me the level of the person's maturity. Ah, I said something. The fact that somebody stands holding a mic before you, has a platform and speaks to you, that does not mean necessarily that the person is mature. I'm not going to repeat it. Some will say, we don't sell the tape, but they used to say, buy the tape. I'll say, go listen to it. Hallelujah. So we take some of these things for granted. And so if we see somebody do it, uh, one person so far told me, said, well, I want you, or I don't know what takes place in the service before you come, you know, uh, uh, on uh, what, what is it? You come on life. But I realized that, yeah, when you come on life, you, you don't pray. I'm already anointed. And I've been thanking you for the anointing. You see, let me tell you something. That is so scary. But let me share it with you to help you. When Revelation came, came for me, I was taken into knowing how to remain in fellowship, constant fellowship, let me put it that way, with the Father. Because it says that if you walk in the light as is in the light, then we have fellowship what? with one another. So he is in us. The, Jesus Christ said, he not only said, the one who sent me is with me. The one who sent me, the Father who sent me is with me. Why can't I say the same thing? You see, so I'm 24. Let me, let me, let me, let me share a bit. I, I, don't, I don't like talking about myself, but this is a good example. When I started seeing God as the Father, my source, it changed everything for me. You see, I've said this over and over, for, but for some, it's going to be the first time. When I breathe in and I breathe out, everything in me is saying, Thank you, Father. Everything. So, I'm beyond that five minutes that I wake up and then say, stand in the corner, I'll kneel down, and then like, I'm acknowledging God. Thank you so much for giving me this life. Every second of my life, I owe it to Him. And every second, I'm grateful to Him. It's become awareness. Some of them say consciousness. I walk in this. I want to say 24 7. Many, many years ago, when I called to do something, it's like, oh wow, I'm not, I'm not prepared. Wow. You know, the days when we used to fast and stuff like that, wow. When you are called upon to do something, you have to set a special day aside, fast and blah, blah, blah. And the first thing is like, you are not even listening to God. He cannot tell me, because we are told that when we pray that we are anointing. How much, how much? And how long did Jesus speak in tongues to walk in anointing, the disciples and stuff like that? We've taken certain things that are out of uh, whatever, I don't know. There are good things in the Bible, but we've, we've twisted them. You can know the will of God just like that without speaking in tongues for what? 10 minutes, 15 minutes. It's true when you speak in tongues, it has to be speaking mysteries to God and all that. 
But the way we put it, now you speak in tongues, and then, because it's coming from a pastor nation, I know, you speak in tongues, and then, and that's how the Father helps you to interpret it, and then you know, whatever, whatever. Anyway, I'm going to leave that alone. So I learned that. So, my, you see, you are saying somebody. I'm not saying I've arrived. I haven't. I'm still a work in progress. But I have a heart of gratitude towards the Heavenly Father, towards God, who is my source. Yeah. So, <laughs> mine is not like devotion. Or you are going to bed and then, like, someone will make a sign of cross. Thank you. You helped me to go through the day. Oh, everything that I did today, oh, I'm so thankful. Everything went well. But the day that doesn't go well, then when you are going to bed, don't even say anything. You see what we do? That is not okay, but it says in everything, give thanks. So it's a life of gratitude. I learned this when I started teaching people praise and worship. Seeing how to lead praise and worship. Seeing the things that the Lord himself was doing in my life. See, I said, when you start, you are not like a cheerleader. And you are cheering people on to sing unto the Lord, to worship the Lord. Have you realized that people who live in the most of the time you are forcing, especially these days? It's a concept. There's no presence. They are just displaying skill without anointing. To, to live praise and worship, it takes three, three factors. There's ability, there's what? Anointing, and there's authority. So when you ask people, lift up your hands. Look, when the Holy Spirit is moving up on somebody, you will not even ask the person to lift their hands. How do you realize that people lift their hands at times you have no ask them? People kneel, you have no ask them to kneel. People what? They prostrate, you have no you don't even ask them to prostrate, but they do it. You get it? Because the Holy Spirit is moving. But when you stand, you yourself, if you don't have a life of worship towards God, a life of worship, the Bible says, present your bodies as a living sacrifice. It says that it's a reasonable service. If you don't do this on daily basis and you stand before people, leading them to worship, then you are trying to ask it where to, what's the word that has to use? What's the word? You have to hide them up. You know, and crank, like you crank your engine, you know, work them, you know, whatever. But you worship, as you worship the Lord, when you stand there, you are worshiping, you know, it's like um, you turn on the AC in your room. No, nobody feels any wind blowing, but the AC is working. The air conditioner is working. And before you realize, everyone says, oh, I love it here. It's, it's cozy. It's cozy. Yeah, that's how it is. It's a life of worship. The same way, if you don't know this, you can look at me, and then you can say something, who is this guy? How come he took the microphone and was introduced? He didn't pray. Let's all pray. And then someone will say, stretch forth your hands towards him and pray for God to anoint him. And today, as I speak, to anoint him so uh, I'll be a blessing to you in the words that I speak. No. This is what I was going to say. Let me go there for you to understand. I said this to somebody, the person got uh, upset with me. <laughs> He said, well, we are intercessors, so we go. Yeah. We go before the service, we go in there, we seek the atmosphere. I said, you do what? Yeah, we go there and we seek the atmosphere. I said, you do? I said, okay, before the service, have you guys have been praying? Yes. I mean, one day, no, many days. They are going to have a program. Let's say conference. And we are going to have uh, the empowerment conference in um, oh, this month, yeah, in August. So we are praying, 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 praying. We pray for everything and anything that we can think about. And the Holy Spirit leading us to do. And then the very day itself, we prayed. Listen to this stuff. We pray. Then the very day of the conference itself, then we come again and say, let's, let's pray again. Let's ask God to move today. In these three days or what, five days, let's ask God to move. What are we doing? The first time or these all these days we've been praying for God to move the conference, didn't he hear us? We don't know how to pray the prayer of Thanksgiving. So I can pray the same way. 
prayer question. I'm not going to pray, God, I'm asking to move. I'll say, thank you, Father, that you are going to move. Thank you for your move in these world days, in these meetings. Thank you for your presence, your glory, your power. Thank you for the salvation we see. Thank you for what? The deliverance, the continuity that we turn around. That is so prayer. God, when I prayed for days, he heard me. That's why when I pick a microphone, I'm introduced. I don't pray. If I pray, it's a prayer of thanksgiving. I won't even pray. Some people pray and say, any spirit that is going to cause any distraction here, disrupt the service, I arrest you. Then they say, the name of Jesus. Then they think that is powerful. No, that is unbelief. I pray already before I go into the service that no spirit will rear its ugly head to disrupt the service. I walk in that answered prayer and I walk in that authority. I walk in that understanding and I walk in that knowing. That anything that is going to rise and uh, uh, come up in the meeting, well, God has given me authority over that already and He's giving me the way we ought to handle it. He's giving me the victory. So when I stand, it's a, you know, it's, a, it's a position of gratitude towards God. You see, and now this is what I do. This will help you. I walk, if I say this, that's why I don't like talking about myself at times. I work hard to stay in consistent sanctification or consecration. Jesus consecrated himself to the Lord. He said, not my will, but your will. If this is the way you want me to go, that's it. So I walk like that. Like the Bible says in the book of uh, 2 Timothy chapter 4, it says, preach the word. Be ready. It's not in this thing and out of season. Yes, that's what it is. You know, so that's how I live my life. I live my life consecrated to him. I'm set apart for him. I'm going to be ready. So anytime I walk because I'm in communion, I know I'll be ministering, let's say, uh, Sunday. I know I'll be ministering Friday or any other day that I'm going to be ministering. I know. You understand? So then I begin to thank him for what he wants me to share, what he wants his people to hear. Because, well, as a father, okay, or as a spiritual leader, I can say, okay, this is happening in our church, in the congregation. I need to address this. I need to address that. And that's all right. But possibly, probably, that is not what God wants you to address. He may want you to address something else. So the Holy Spirit leads you. You know, He gives you things that you have to walk. Sure. For instance, what I wrote as my title, if I share that with you, you'll be shocked. Uh, you were once for darkness. And that's what I wanted to focus on. Why the Bible says you were once darkness. But you see, you see where I'm being? All this while, and my time is, you know, like five minutes more. Is that? You see what I mean? Yes. That's how you walk with the Holy Spirit. You see, you shouldn't be rigid. You shouldn't be tight. You shouldn't be legalistic. But it takes years walking with Him, yielding to the Word of God, yielding to the promptings of the Holy Spirit, and then it becomes what a habit. The habit becomes character. You live in it. It becomes easy. Hallelujah. So, the Holy Spirit is the helper. You change today, then you turn God for help. 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 The time you were saying, what are my steps? That was a different era. Now, we know what to do. We know what steps to take. Because His Word directs us. Tell me this situation. You see, this one, counseling people, is easy for me. And God has been using me in that area to minister to people. Counseling. You see, because when they come to me, they think their issue is so great, unsurmountable. It's like this and it's like that. And they speak them to me, it's like, oh, this is not a problem. Oh, Pastor, I want you to pray for me. I said, no, this is not a prayer problem. But it's, I said, go do this, go do this. That's what the Bible says. They don't get it because well, they don't even know it. You know what I'm saying? Yes. So, this, if you, the more you study the word, you know, give yourself to the study of the word. To a fine ministry that will find you in your life. Hallelujah. The Holy Spirit, He's all that. He's the help. Hallelujah. Let's go back and finish what we're reading. 
in uh, Romans chapter 8, and then I'll just say it. So the Holy Spirit himself will remind you all the time, will bear witness, will testify to you that you are what? You are a child of God. Okay, 17. Verse 17. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, heirs of God. You see, sonship, adoption, sonship, adoption. It happened instantaneously when you accepted Jesus Christ as the Messiah. But now, you see, this is what I'm teaching now. It's like you didn't know that. So the dynamics, the depth, the length, the height of it is what we are learning now. So every believer should know these things, learn these things, and then it, it fortifies you. You know, you know you walk afraid anymore. I'm telling you. You know, if you have problems with fear, oh, uh, what uh, misfortune? I'm afraid. I'm, uh, I have the fear of misfortune, the fear of danger, the fear of calamity, the fear of untimely death, and whatever. You become free from all these things. Hallelujah. A four, heirs and heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ. Hallelujah. That's what it says. Adoption. Sonship, they are talking about adoption. As many as we see them, to them he gave. And so when he says you were once darkness, I'll talk about it another time. He's trying to tell you something. You are no longer in the dark. Darkness does not have rule or authority over you. You are not in the domain of darkness. You are in a different place. Great, powerful covenant based on what? Better promises. Because of what Jesus Christ has done. He laid down his life. He put in the work, not you. All that we have to do is to accept. Just accept, no, and accept. No, accept, or receive. No, receive, no, receive. And walk in and be, and be what? Thankful. Be thankful. Be thankful. If you, if you understand this, you realize that, check your own prayer. You realize that a lot of things that people are praying for, they don't need to ask. Or I must say ask. And asking God to give them, they don't need to. Because the helper, is ability that God has also given you. Whatever ability that you think you need in this life, He has already, you are blessed. He's already what? Giving you. Okay, you see what I said just now? That's another thing. People say, God bless you. And, you know, with revelation, I realize that you are blessed already. So I don't say, God bless you. But we still say that because it's popular. If you say that to an unbeliever, that is a different thing. But on the basis of what Jesus has done, blessing is waiting for you. So you can tell the person you can come to that blessing. <laughs> Hallelujah. Alright, so then I'll end on this note. And I'll charge you the words in Galatians chapter 5, verses uh, 1 and uh, 13. Stand firm the liberty when with Jesus, the anointed one, has made us free. And do not be again entangled with the yoke of bondage, but by love. Serve one another, love you dearly. 